Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to this webinar. It's a joint ICLA REN21 webinar where we will be talking about city data and advancing renewable energy policy development and climate action. Very briefly, if I could introduce the agenda to you. Uh, my name is Marijke van Staden. I'm the director of the Carbon Center and manager of ICLA's low carbon city agenda. I will be your moderator today and give a brief introduction on a number of um, slides and set the topic. Then I will hand over to Anna March. She is focusing on local renewable energy commitments and actions captured in the Carbon Climate Registry. Uh, we're delighted to have Lloyd with us. Lloyd Lee from the city of Vancouver will focus on the role of data for reporting in Vancouver's greenest cities and renewable city plans. And Rana Adib will wrap up for us from REN21. She's the research coordinator and will give an update on the Renewables Global Status Report and the Outlook for 2018, which I hope will be just as amazing as the previous reports. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, please use the chat function if you need technical assistance. And without much ado, let's jump into our webinar. Next slide, please. Thank you. So we know local governments um, and communities at the local level worldwide are really um, more actively engaging in renewable energy um, and getting very enthusiastic, in particular focusing on the benefits that could help them reduce their air pollutions and health risks because they're switching away from fossil fuels towards clean renewable energy. They also reduce fossil fuel imports and keep money in the local economy which in turn can help stimulate local job creation. We know that there are amazing potentials for generating revenue from selling excess renewable energy that is produced and not needed locally. We also have seen a growing understanding that there would be improved energy access and more reliable energy provision as renewables are embedded and you have more decentralized systems with ideally also the prices reducing step by step um, to make the energy affordable um, and sustainable with a low impact on the environment. Many local governments have set their targets, making sure that it can strengthen their community and sustainable development approaches. And indeed, Vancouver will share their view in part of this as well. And last but not least, we know that local climate action, local renewable energy implementation can effectively contribute to national and international targets and energy goals, as well as climate goals to reduce emissions. Next slide, please. Now, we know cities and local governments worldwide are more and more supporting the use and an understanding of how local renewable energy can be deployed. And they do this in the normal way that they also have dealt and are dealing with their climate action. So they set a target, ideally for both governmental operations, as well as for the whole community. Governmental operations would refer, for example, to their own energy use in their own municipal buildings. And for the whole community, it would include the private sector, citizens, um, as well as ideally uh, the industry. We know that they're defining their different strategies and developing action plans, clearly stepping, setting out step by step what they wish to do and creating policies and regulations, which essentially are using incentives and disincentives to help people change their behavior and to help that transition to a renewable energy future. Last but not least, energy stakeholders are everybody in the community. So engaging your stakeholders and helping that they understand their role in this roadmap, in the strategy, and making sure that they can build capacity of local partners with other experts who can help them understand and shape a clear strategy and understanding of the role of every stakeholder in the community and also within the country. And finally, investing. Finances need to flow to make sure renewable energy um, investments are made. And local governments, in addition, also have a number of other financing mechanisms, such as including uh, and adopting green public procurement approaches in their action plans. Now, we know that city data is needed and it could potentially also help uh, improve an understanding how to enable 
um, the system and make sure that there is an enabling policy framework in place at the national level, but also at the global level, where we will hear from Rana talking about the REN21 activities in this regard. Next slide, please. As you all might have heard, and I hope you have, that the preparation towards COP21 to reach this Paris Climate Agreement has been uh, successful after many, many years of work. And finally, the Paris Agreement is um, active and has entered into force. It's already being ratified by 160 parties to the UNFCCC. So these are national governments that are committed to the convention, not yet all have done so yet, uh, but the, we hope the ratification process will continue. And we've also now started many processes to understand how the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs, could be further refined and defined to make sure that we can reach the target set in the Paris Agreement, which basically means to remain under a two degrees Celsius rise. We have a severe problem because currently, the aggregated numbers listed in the NDCs do not yet reach uh, the required emissions reduction, so more work needs to be done. And the COP23 this year will definitely offer an opportunity to make sure we can continue that discussion and map what is happening and should be happening in the future. The COP23 this year will take place in Bonn in Germany, but it is also interestingly enough hosted by Fiji, which is increasingly also interested as an island state and representing other island states to look at sustainable energy um, that can help them improve their access to energy, but also looking at that adaptation and climate resilience angle. So it's not purely a mitigation discussion that we have at the COP this year. The continue, continued dialogue in 2018 um, will include IRENA's white paper with national government policy recommendations. So this is going to be quite an important event to discuss and hopefully have many national governments that are not yet committed on this pathway to at least observe and learn and hopefully engage in the discussions. And then we definitely look forward to the REN21 Global Status Report of 2018, which gives a very concise and interesting overview of what's happening and where are things moving but also where maybe things are not moving so fast, which we can also zoom in into the future. We definitely also have a scientific angle. So if you look at the IPCC's role, they will develop a special report on the impacts of global warming of a 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway that will be released in September. In the meantime, there are many, many groups and actors coming together to look at various components that also could support and underpin this work to make sure the Paris Agreement would be effective and that the NDCs that are currently being submitted have been upgraded or are in the process of being further refined, that these would be robust NDCs that would include and very definitely embed the renewable energy aspect within their plans. Next slide, please. Now, we know a lot has been happening, so there are opportunities coming up which are directly also relevant to all of you. In particular, um, under and as partnership with the ARENA Coalition for Action, there is a city survey on community energy. Now, we are calling for input with our partners to help inform national government policies and making recommendations on community energy. This will also contribute to ARENA's white paper uh, that will be discussed then next year in January. And we will see at least a snapshot of preliminary findings here at the COP23 in Bonn. So if you take a look at the link below, until the 27th of September, you have an opportunity to still dig in and give us your feedback, uh, which we would really highly welcome. Next slide, please. As you might know, uh, ICLEI leads currently on managing the global 100% renewable energy cities and regions network. This is quite an important network because we do aim at making sure that we understand what such a pathway could look like, um, but also helping the cities, towns and regions to set their targets in at least one sector or ideally to commit a um, 100% renewable energy pathway for the whole community and that have an interest in international cooperation 
which also means sharing peer-to-peer -peer exchanges and making sure the message gets out that we all understand where things could be moving to and practically how to get to that point of defining 100% target roadmap and reporting on this. This is a community of practice for knowledge exchange and policy dialogue. It's open, it's free of charge, it's inclusive. So if you represent a local or another subnational government level, please reach out to us. Um, the email address for ICLA is there. We have two websites that you can take a look at to see and get a bit more details about this. But this is indeed the network to go to if you wish to explore cutting edge renewable energies at the local level. Thank you very much. Handing over, I believe, nearly now to Anna. Let's see the next slide. Thank you very much, Marika. Uh, I'll uh, uh, start very quickly uh, by saying hello, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all, uh, and moving uh, to a slide on the Carbon Climate Registry. Uh, but uh, indeed, I'll be showing you uh, the, the the overview, let's say, of the data that cities, towns and regions have been reporting in the Carbon Climate Registry and that shows that the local governments are already giving a meaningful contribution to the transition to a renewable energy future. So let's get started. The Carbon Climate Registry is the global reporting cities. Uh, I apologize, it's a global reporting platform for cities, towns and regions that are tackling climate change. It was created in 2010 to support a, a transparency, accountability and credibility of local and subnational climate action. And uh, over these years, of these six years of accumulated experience, uh, we've received reports from over 900 cities worldwide, cities, towns and regions, uh, representing about 10% of the world population. So indeed, uh, really, this platform has grown over time. It is operated by the Carbon Center, uh, located at the Clay World Secretariat in Bonn. So here in this in this slide, in addition to the overall numbers of reporting in carbon, you can see also uh, the box at the bottom, uh, some numbers specifically looking at renewable energy generation actions, uh, renewable energy targets and energy performance. This is basically the universe of data that I'll be exploring with you today uh, to extract a few messages that hopefully will be of interest to you. So let's get started with the energy targets reported. Uh, the renewable energy uh, targets reported in carbon by local governments, as you can see on the top graphic, cover mostly uh, the community. About 60% of the reported targets covered the entire community, while about 40% zoom in on local government operations. Both are important. Uh, the local government operations uh, targets usually are very important milestones when moving to community targets. Regarding the sectors of the economy that are covered by, this, uh, by these uh, targets, the local targets, we see that they cover electricity mostly, but there's also a significant coverage regarding heating and cooling and transport. Uh, industry not uh, is not uh, uh, covered with su such high expression, but also to be noted that there are indeed local governments that uh, consider that it is in their mandate to also influence the the behavior of the industry within their jurisdiction. Uh, on average, one lesson that uh, I believe is important, although this is very intuitive, the data that has been reported in carbon does dem demonstrate this clearly. So on average, the cities that have renewable energy targets report twice as many renewable energy actions as the cities that do not have such targets. So we believe that this indeed illustrates really well in practice that the approval of targets helps local governments to legitimize further allocation of resources 
to implement related actions, be them financial resources or human resources expertise and so on. Let me move to the next slide just to give you an example from one of the cities that has reported renewable energy targets uh, in the Carbon Climate Registry. This is not the only one. For example, Vancouver, also in the webinar today, uh, is another city that has reported 100% renewable energy targets. But so let me also here focus on the case of Malmo uh, that has reported two these two types of, uh, of targets that I've mentioned. So they aim to, be, to reach 100% renewable energy in local government operations by 2020 and achieve 100% renewable energy at community scale uh, by 2030. And uh, together with IRENA, we've developed a very nice case study that illustrates how these targets have allowed the mainstreaming of renewable energy support across the city plans. So this is a resource that uh, you can consult in case you are interested in. So let me move to the next slide now to tell you a little bit about the renewable energy actions that have been reported in the Carbon Climate Registry. And I should say that these are the ones to which the city specifically indicated that the action uh, addresses renewable energy generation. There may be other actions that are reported that indirectly relate also to renewable energy generation but has not been indicated as the main focus of the action. For example, uh, let's say green, a city uh, sets a program for green bonds and these, for example, can cover energy efficiency projects and renewable energy projects and th those actions would also be relevant, of course, um, for the advancement in the advancement in renewable energy, but here, as I was telling you at the beginning in the initial slide, I am zooming in on those actions that the cities specifically listed as being directly zooming in on renewable energy uh, generation. And we see that local governments have a wide range of roles, mandates and instruments that they can use to support the transition to renewable energy. Marika has already focused this before and we see this through the data uh, that has been reported in CARBON. We see that indeed most of the actions that the cities are taking and are reporting in the CARBON Climate Registry are technical or infrastructure investments in nature, uh, but there are also many other types of actions that uh, cities find relevant and report in this platform. So, for example, this is followed by uh, policies, strategies and action plans with about 60% of these actions reported and then followed by a big category, uh, a category that can uh, include many different types of actions covering from education, awareness raising, stakeholder engagement, organizational aspects and governance, etc. Followed then also by fiscal and financial mechanisms, then by assessment, research uh, and studies but also regulatory me uh, measures. So this is the overview of the renewable energy actions uh, reported in the CARBON. I want to give you a couple of examples regarding the main types uh, so that you see what you, we are talking about because we do have a lot of examples from all over the world of things that cities are implementing already. So. Uh, for example, this case, uh, an example of a technical infrastructure investment uh, by the city of Vecchio in Sweden. In this case, it's a biomass cogeneration plant. And we have here, we, see, we can see the type of detail that cities are invited uh, to report through this platform uh, in a transparent way as indicated. So, for example, the budget, uh, the estimated annual uh, production of renewable energy, including electricity and heat, but also the greenhouse gas emissions reductions uh, expected from the measures. Let's look at another example, in this case uh, from a fiscal financial mechanism action type. Uh, it's uh, an example from Seoul. Uh, it's the Solar Power Generation Citizens Fund. And what this does is allow citizens to make direct investments in photovoltaic uh, power generation plants 
and earn profits through this mechanism. So in a way, it's the local government encouraging really uh, community power, community uh, uh, community support and investment uh, in the local renewable uh, renewable energy resources. Uh, let me also give you uh, an example which you may have very well heard of already because this is known worldwide indeed. So we have here an example of a regulatory measure. It's the solar thermal ordinance that the city of Bar Barcelona approved quite a few years back already and they they were uh, a bit of a, a pioneers in this sense they were the first european city to develop this type of ordinance and to make uh, compulsory the use of solar energy solar thermal energy initially and this was later reviewed in 2011 to actually also include uh, solar photovoltaic uh, and to that's enlarged the scope, but this was really one of the pioneers uh, in this, and this was an example that was replicated by many cities, at least 50 cities in Spain alone, but by cities worldwide, and we also have a case study on this, in case you are interested uh, to, to learn more. It's a, it is indeed a very interesting case. Uh, and now also an example from stakeholder engagement. All these different types of actions, indeed, they we could give you many different examples. But and in this category specifically, of course, even more diversity we could have. But so regarding stakeholder engagement, we have here an action that was reported by Umia municipality in Sweden. And uh, this uh, pertains uh, to a partnership that was established uh, with financing from two counties, from the municipalities in those two counties and from about 15 companies that came together uh, to make this possible uh, with the development of biogas filling stations in northern Sweden but with a significant effort in the engagement of the different uh, stakeholders and communities including schools and the citizens the officials the politicians including in coordination uh, with projects at the European level finally uh, I would also like to show you an example uh, from an action that covers organizational aspects. In this case, the creation of a local energy and climate agency uh, by a small community in France. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is actually a type of action that, uh, that uh, is very common within the European Union. Uh, where specific funding programs have been made available. And this has been the case because it has been recognized how important it is to have a group of people that are uh, highly qualified to be able to advise the citizens and the stakeholders on the opportunities to exist, to advance on renewable energy uh, use, but also uh, regarding energy efficiency and so on. So the local energy agencies can uh, can play a very important role uh, in enabling uh, actions, concrete other concrete actions to then be be undertaken. So uh, that's why we thought this would also be a good example to share with you. Um, of course, like I said, many many other different actions could be listed here with examples, but this was just to give you an overview and then a little sample of the types of actions that cities are reporting and, and encourage you to report what your city is doing and, and go further. But so now looking at the, the, the overview again, uh, so regarding funding, one thing that, that is clear is that regarding the reported action, uh, the majority um, uh, of these actions is actually funded by the local government's own budget. Uh, so this is the main source of funding uh, reported. Then uh, it's folded by subnational uh, funding and then the public-private partnerships are listed as third with 15% of the actions. Uh, but as you can see here, international funding um, it plays a, a relatively small role uh, so far in the funding of these actions that have been reported. Uh, the, the graphic at the bottom also shows you uh, the status of the, of the actions reported so far. 
just to give you an idea. Uh, now I would like to move to another type of uh, reporting of data that is reported in the Carbon Climate Registry. We've already covered targets, we've covered actions. Now let's talk about performance because indeed uh, reporting in Carbon is a way uh, to demonstrate that you are indeed monitoring your performance and it's also a way to demonstrate results. It's also a way to help identify what could be improved. And we have here an example from Vacuum Municipality. Uh, this is taken from the Carbon Climate Registry. You can, you can see the city profile of the city there. What I want to highlight is that um, the, the city, for example, uh, has been doing very significant progress. And we can show this because indeed the city has been done this effort regularly of quantifying and reporting um, uh, its energy performance, not just its energy performance, also actually its greenhouse gas emission performance, but here uh, specifically zooming in on energy. Uh, and uh, we see that the city is well on target to is well on the path to achieve its 2030 targets of 100% renewable energy at community scale, with uh, a a share of renewable energy of 64%. Um, and this is data of 2015, I should say. And zooming in specifically on the heating sector, on district energy in particular, we see that the city is almost already uh, reaching 100% renewable energy in this sector, with very good progress being made. So um, uh, this this uh, this has already covered the main areas of reporting within Carbon. I do apologize for the huge amount of text that we have in this slide. Uh, this is basically to help my memory, to aid my memory. Uh, but the message that is important for you to take home is what is written in bold at the bottom. But I'll get to that. So, looking at the data that we have uh, that we have received from cities. Uh, one thing is that we can see that cities are indeed making uh, significant efforts to really monitor and report. Uh, and we can see that, for example, the first statement here, the first bullet, we can see that out of the cities that have reported targets, renewable energy targets in the Carbon Climate Registry, 72% are monitoring and reporting their energy performance. Uh, however, uh, things could be improved. So of the actions that have been reported, of the 870 actions that specifically pertain to renewable energy generation, only 12% of those actions actually quantified the impacts in terms of renewable energy generation or renewable energy consumption and of greenhouse gas emissions avoided. Um, and indeed, a lot. This leads us to the third bullet point here in the slide. Indeed, we need to do wider motivation and mobilization uh, of local and subnational governments uh, to adequately capture the magnitude of their contribution to the energy transition. Because we know that cities are doing so much more that is not yet being captured in the Carbon Climate Registry or other uh, other platforms. So, the question to you, the challenge that we put on the table to you, is your city, your town or your region reporting in the Carbon Climate Registry? You can check here. Uh, using this URL, you can directly see. Uh, if your city is not there, it means that they have not registered yet and they have not started reporting. Uh, and we warmly invite you to, to uh, to do so, to report, and why? Why Why should cities be interested in this, cities, towns and regions, why should they be interested in this, in reporting in the Carbon Climate Registry? So the Carbon Climate Registry can give you worldwide visibility. It can. It is a platform that enables you to showcase your climate and energy commitments, your actions and your progress, and this way you can help us uh, to celebrate your leadership, your good examples, your expertise, and to further disseminate. So this can be a very good argument to persuade your city council to report. 
uh, it's also a way to move from local to global to influence not just your own local jurisdiction but also to influence what's happening at national and global level and Marika has already mentioned several opportunities in terms of advocacy that we have coming up um, Rana will also tell you more about this um, but uh, certainly this is this is also a very good argument to to take into consideration and uh, the CCR um, is uh, uh, is indeed uh, an opportunity to do this. It's one platform for all, uh, so one pl platform that serves many initiatives, 16 initiatives uh, as far as we are aware. Uh, one of these initiatives is the Global 100% Renewable Energy uh, uh, Cities and Regions Network, uh, which Marika has also mentioned before. Um, uh, another good reason uh, to report is to demonstrate good governance. Uh, so publicly share information, be transparent, be accountable, uh, be credible. And this can really, in a way, this is a way to do, uh, this helps to demonstrate that you are measuring, reporting and verifying uh, your climate and energy data. And this can be important, for example, if you are trying to seek funding. Uh, for specific measures, for specific initiatives. So this is also a good argument. Uh, it's also a way to support and inform your community and your stakeholders, including your council, your staff, your citizens, businesses, industries, uh, and uh, other levels of government. And it's also a way to compare and to, com to compare your performance with other cities and to learn from other cities. Uh, so definitely a lot of good reasons to report uh, to the Carbon Climate Registry um, and uh, here are uh, also trying to highlight a few additional opportunities that the Carbon Climate Registry offers you in terms of advocacy and visibility. So uh, for example the initiative led by the uh, WWF, uh, One Planet City Challenge, uh, this Take note of the deadline. Actually, for all these uh, items listed here in the slide, the deadline is September 30th. So you have about one month to participate if you are interested. Uh, with the data, the data that we have uh, reported in the Carbon Climate Registry, every year we produce um, aggregated reports. And these reports are uh, very important in terms of advocacy. Uh, they are shared in the context of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change negotiations, where it plays focal point for the local government and municipal authorities constituencies. So reports gain visibility in this. Um, and uh, uh, the Carbon Climate Registry also feeds data to the NASCA platform. Uh, so uh, these are a few of the opportunities that you have uh, for this upcoming month. So if you are interested, and I hope that I've given you enough reasons uh, to motivate you to encourage your city, town or region uh, to report, uh, your climate and energy data, it's very simple. Go to Carbon, double N, in homage to the host city of Bonn, carbon.org and click the button Participate. Uh, it's a two-step two process. You'll first register uh, to create an account and then you'll be able to report. And the reporting is done in a very simple way uh, by using an offline sheet. Uh, an offline uh, file, Excel file, which is filled in offline and uh, that can then be uploaded. And if you have reported before, this, uh, this form will already be pre-populated uh, with the information that you've provided and this will make it easier for you to update it. Uh, now we do recommend, just one last quick note to say that we do recommend uh, reporting at least on your targets, yeah, on your renewable energy targets, but also please feel free to include any other relevant targets like for example energy efficiency. Um, 
please report also your actions uh, and action plans if you have if you have already adopted them um, and uh, uh, don't forget to include your energy performance to really demonstrate uh, your progress so uh, with this uh, I'm coming close to the end of this presentation from my side I'm getting close to handover uh, and uh, I'll be uh, uh, we have with us we are lucky to have with us as Marika mentioned the city of Vancouver and here you can see a little print screen uh, from the report in the carbon climate registry that shows the overview of the city of Vancouver uh, so Without further ado, I would just like to show you here our contacts once again and uh, encourage you to connect with us if you need any support uh, in reporting to the Carbon Climate Registry. And also, once again, if you are interested to connect, uh, if your city, town or region is interested in engaging in the Global 100% Renewable Energy Cities and Regions Network, please do not hesitate to connect with us. Uh, so with this, I briefly hand over uh, back to Marika. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you very much for the questions coming in. I think we'll deal with these um, step by step after the, all the presentations have been completed. Um, there is, however, just one practical question. We will share the presentations and the recording after the webinar, so um, make sure that you don't need to ask for that again. And we'd be delighted if you ask questions also that could be considered for the REN21 report because there is time to still answer some of those. Um, and I'll um, review briefly some of those questions that came in as well. But we'll keep on posting your questions and we'll get back to those after the presentations. Uh, now, without much ado, I'd like to hand over to Lloyd Lee to give us um, that amazing overview of what Vancouver is doing. So, Lloyd, the floor is yours. Hi there. Um, thanks very much, Marika. Uh, yeah, so, my name is Lloyd Lee. I'm the Monitoring and Reporting Planner here at the City of Vancouver. Um, hi, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to give you just a little background on Vancouver's uh, sustainability plan, um, our targets and our metrics, and uh, the role of reporting and all that, and uh, some of the benefits that we see. Um, to regular reporting as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the, um, the Greenest City Action Plan is Vancouver's sustainability plan. It was approved um, by City Council in uh, 2011 uh, with a nine-year mandate. It sets a, a time horizon of 2020 um, to become the greenest city in the world. Um, what does that actually mean, though, is the big question that we often get. Um, the plan was branded the greenest city because it was deliberately um, vague, deliberately ambiguous. Um, a, a lot of people and some of our critics as well will ask us, you know, what does green even mean? What does the greenest city mean? What does that mean? And um, this broad planning um, actually allows the plan to kind of shift with different audiences. It lets it resonate with different audiences, um, both locally and internationally, um, who might have different notions of what sustainability means. It's uh, an incredibly broad plan. It's not just carbon. It also looks at local food. It looks at transportation, looks at uh, green jobs. And so um, the, the, the idea that we would be the greenest city in a, a number of different areas is, is, is um, sort of one thing that we want to capture. Um, and um, to try and contain all that aspiration within an actionable framework. Sorry, next slide, please. Um, to try and contain all that, that, that um, that, that aspiration within an actionable framework that we could communicate easily, um, we came up with this. Um, this, is, this is how we frame the Greenest City Action Plan. Um, we seek to achieve three broad aspirational objectives to work towards uh, zero carbon emissions, zero waste, and healthy ecosystems. And each of the 10 goal areas contained in the plan are clustered according to uh, which of these three broad uh, objectives um, that they most support. Next slide, please. Since the, um, since the goals are quite long-term, um, 17 targets were set uh, and tracked very closely, tracked annually. Um, within the plan, um, there were a suite of over 120 quick start and priority actions that formed the, the short-term roadmap um, for the first few years of the plan. We revised the plan um, in uh, 2015, halfway through our mandate. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, the, the metrics, the overall sort of goals that we uh, uh, um, that we set, 
uh, were designed to be um, outcome-based versus process. We want to focus on um, where we want to get to by 2020 rather than how we were going to get there. And this allows um, the city organization as a whole to focus um, on the long-term goals and to leave room for the departments within the city that actually own the goals um, to pursue them in the best way possible. Um, this is important just to embed responsibility for the Green City Action Plan, uh, not just within the sustainability department, um, but to spread out the sort of the responsibility across the entire city. Um, we here, I, I sit in the sustainability group here, um, we're not the subject matter experts for solid waste management, for instance, or, um, or, or community-wide transportation planning. Um, those, that expertise sits in other parts of the organization. Um, so what we've done is embedded the responsibility for delivering on Green City to those departments, and then they can pursue their targets and their goals in the, in the, in the way that they see fit. Next slide, please. Um, so with regard to reporting, um, a big part of the Green City from the beginning was ensuring that we stay accountable for our actions. And as such, um, we report to several different frameworks and requirements. Uh, and we maintain several slightly different inventories at both the corporate and the community-wide levels now. Um, when the Green City was approved by Council, um, it was recognized that uh, public accountability and engagement was an important component to ensure success. Um, annual reporting helps to maintain momentum internally and um, to help maintain support um, amongst our residents of the public and uh, also our elected officials as well just to maintain their sort of focus, given all the other things that they have to look at, um, that we want to maintain sort of the, 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 the urgency around uh, acting on, 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 on climate action. So um, some of the benefits that we've seen uh, as far as this, this regular reporting, uh, as I mentioned, um, that was a public accountability and engagement piece, uh, maintaining uh, momentum amongst uh, all the stakeholders. Um, provincially, um, we're located in the province of British Columbia here in Canada, and uh, BC, British Columbia was one of the first jurisdictions in the world to implement a, a revenue neutral carbon tax. Um, and uh, as a city within BC, we're entitled to a refund of the carbon tax that we pay as a corporate entity on all the fuel that we purchase in our operations, um, as long as we complete reporting to the province. So, um, so, so that's one piece that we, we, we are uh, obligated to do. Um, meanwhile, um, all these reporting uh, requirements um, have exposure at a local level and are very useful to engage our constituents. But um, Vancouver also wants to be uh, an active participant in the global community um, as far as city level uh, sustainability. And um, we've been fortunate to have been recognized for, for our efforts. But um, the one point that I left off the slide that actually is most important is that um, it, it isn't the recognition necessarily, but the opportunity to share best practices and to share our stories with other cities and to learn from other leading cities as well. That's been of enormous benefit to us. Next slide, please. So just taking a look at um, the sort of the different levels of reporting that we, we do every year, um, I, I should mention that um, reporting was such a foundational piece of um, the Green City um, when it was um, uh, uh, founded, I guess, <laughs> was uh, that they actually created a position um, to, to a full-time position to, to purely monitor and report on Green City. And that's actually where I sit. So I'm very thankful for that. But <laughs> um, yeah, to have a full-time staffer uh, uh, allocated to this role um, uh, isn't something that a lot of cities have or are able to do. Um, we're very fortunate that way. But um, uh, in that respect, it allows us to participate in all of these different platforms to, to, um, to, to fulfill all of these obligations and to really look deeply at um, at what reporting means and, and strategically where, where that can lead us to. Um, anyways, as far as uh, local reporting goes, um, as I mentioned, the accountability and engagement piece uh, was an important component to ensure our long-term success. Um, so we provide uh, annual updates. Um, the top three um, images there are just covers from our recent um, annual updates that we publish. We're in the sixth cycle now, the sixth year of providing annual updates to the public. Um, also, you'll see there um, our dashboard that's published as part of that uh, update as well. Um, I should mention all of these are available on our website as PDFs on uh, the City of Vancouver's website if, if you want to take a look at those. Um, but this dashboard appears in every annual update. 
um, and it just shows our progress against our 17 metrics, um, our baseline year, our current year's uh, uh, achievement level, um, whether we have progressed on our targets, yes or no, and, um, and where we're headed to by 2020. Um, the footnotes on the left-hand side there that you can't read uh, get denser and denser every year um, as we try to maintain transparency in our reporting process um, while trying to balance the level of detail for a broad range of audiences. This document has to speak to members of the public uh, for whom this might not be their field of expertise, um, to audiences such as yourselves who are, are, are way more expert um, in this field. Um, we've also embedded uh, a lot of the same metrics, actually all of the same metrics uh, within our financial reporting that we do to the public every year as well. Um, and that's the middle image there, our, our 2016 budget there. Um, embedding this again helps plant sustainability as a fundamental service that the city provides uh, across all of our departments. Uh, rather than a, a standalone effort um, that could become vulnerable if the political climate changes. And we're still, even um, in, in Vancouver, where we're blessed with a, a lot of political support and a lot of public support for this, um, you know, that, that there's always a risk that uh, the pendulum could swing the other way and sort of, you know, slow down or derail some of our, our progress here. Um, both um, the budget and our annual um, Green City reporting help to maintain that momentum internally, as I mentioned, and to help maintain our support. So. Um, and again, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, uh, as part of our provincial reporting obligations, we report our corporate inventory as well as our corporate and community-wide actions, our qualitative actions around climate as well. We report that to our province. Um, nationally, we are also a member of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, um, which administers ICLE in Canada and has its own national measures reports, which we uh, contribute to. And that's on the right-hand side there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, all of those have exposure at a local level and they're useful. Um, again, Vancouver wants to be um, a global player uh, in this field. Um, part of achieving uh, that visibility um, is reporting to, to CDP, to C40 cities, um, to Carbon, of course, and, and to the Global Covenant of Mayors. Um, you know, we, we see a lot of benefits from reporting, as Anna mentioned, in terms of visibility. Um, moving our efforts from uh, local to uh, a global stage and uh, to demonstrate uh, transparency and good governance. Um, and we've seen all of those benefits. Um, we've also, uh, we're also super proud um, to have been named uh, the Earth Hour City Challenge, uh, which is now the One Planet City Challenge, I guess, um, global champion back in 2013. And uh, we're the national champion for Canada uh, in 2015. Um, and this is purely through our uh, annual participation in Carbon. Um, this has garnered us a lot of attention globally. Um, and uh, locally, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing accolade for our staff. It's a testament to, to all the work that we're doing. Um, and for our elected officials as well, it's a fantastic talking point for them um, and something for our, our residents here in Vancouver to be proud of, to be um, a global leader in this field. Great. Um, next slide, please. Um, reporting um, going forward uh, will, will continue to be a big part of Green City. Um, sorry, the, the next slide, it's not showing up for me, but um, there we are. Uh, yeah, it'll continue to be a big part of Greenest City. Um, uh, reporting regularly helps um, normalize uh, a regular engagement with the public around this. As I mentioned, you know, the public uh, and our elected officials, everyone has a, a lot of stuff to deal with right now. Vancouver, um, for instance, right now is in um, the, the throes of an affordability issue. And so uh, everyone is quite focused on that. Oh, sorry, what, back one slide, please. Um, and so just maintaining our momentum, maintaining our focus on, on uh, environmental action is, 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 is pretty key. Um, so uh, Green City originally was uh, slated to end by 2020, so uh, the planning exercise around Green City beyond 2020 uh, will get underway in the next year or so. Um, and we'll be looking again at reporting cycles, um, what gets reported, what format that gets reported in, um, in a way that's most strategic to engage and to inform all of our different audiences. Um, I should mention that when the Green City was um, developed, um, our metrics were developed with the best knowledge at the time, but um, Green City Beyond 2020 will give us a chance to revise some of those to more established and meaningful metrics. I've got an example here. Um, we have uh, a target in our um, access to nature uh, goal uh, of um, um, residents 
uh, people in Vancouver um, having access to green space, uh, parks and green space. And so um, this was a target, um, a five minute walk target to green space uh, developed back in 2010. And it measures how much of the city's non-industrial land area uh, is close to green space. Um, and now as cities around North America are more focused on uh, a similar metrics, um, this concept has been explored, it's been refined um, to include things like how many people, how many residents actually live close to parks and green space. Um, how easy is it for them to get there? Um, for example, are there big hills in the way? Are there busy intersections that they have to cross? Um, are there any barriers to getting to that green space? And then uh, what do you get once you get to that green space, the quality of the green space? Is it a small patch of grass with a tree or, or is it a playground, swimming pool, more amenities like that? Um, so last year, our parks board revised this metric to look at uh, the number of residents within a five minute walk, not the land area. And the numbers on the screen represent this newer and more refined way to, to, to look at access um, to green space in Vancouver. Um, however, I'll mention that anytime you change targets that have been released publicly, you have to deal with the risk that um, people uh, will think that you're, you're, trying to change the, you're trying to change the goalposts, basically. And um, a lot of communication has to take place with public, uh, with stakeholders, and also with our senior management and with council um, whenever we do that. Um, the one time um, in the life of Green City where we did a metrics refresh was back in 2015 um, when we refreshed all of our actions as well. Um, so we're actually holding off on reporting on this new metric um, likely until we're ready to roll out uh, whatever Green City Beyond 2020 looks like. Um, as far as the Renewable City plan goes, um, I'll mention that the, the 2050 plan uh, focuses on transitioning our entire community to renewable energy. Uh, in its buildings and transportation by 2050. Uh, we set some very ambitious targets and we're currently drafting the high level implementation plan with interim targets for uh, 2025, 2030, 2040 and so on. Um, reporting uh, will form again a foundational part of this too um, with public uh, council and stakeholder reporting and engagement built into the plan from the start. Um, right now we're looking at annual updates um, with I think a four year cycle of more fulsome updates um, to coincide with our election cycle and also with our capital planning process as well, so for instance. Um, and I think that's it actually. Um, next slide is my last slide. Um, thanks very much. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact me, um, use the chat there, or um, yeah, contact me after, after the, the presentation as well. Uh, thanks very much and, and back to you. Great. Thank you very much, Lloyd. It's very exciting to see also the comprehensiveness of your approach is, is, is exactly where we wish to go. Maybe one quick question, uh, <clears throat> if I may. How many people are actually working on reporting with you um, in Vancouver? Is it quite a substantial number or is it a small group? Just me. <laughs> just you. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I, yeah, around Green, Green City or just me. Um, we definitely have um, uh, other programs around uh, social sustainability and um, uh, economic as well, the three pillars. Um, they, are, they, they are owned by other departments within the city and um, they would have their own sort of reporting officers, but no one, no one dedicated um, okay. to do that. Yeah. Okay, well, amazing job, well done. And without much ado, I'd love to introduce you to Anna Radik. Uh, Rana works for REN21 um, and they bring out this very, very interesting global status report on renewables every year. So Rana, um, over to you and then we will take some questions at the end. Okay, thank you, Marika. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy uh, that we uh, managed together with Ikli to have a specific um, yeah, webinar on reporting renewable energy at the local level just because we really see that uh, local renewables and local decision makers uh, play an increasingly important role um, in yeah, moving forward on the renewable energy side. So I'll quickly present to you um, the Global Sets Report and some of the results of the last, um, of the last version. But before doing this, so, and also to explain your approach, I'll just mention what Rent21 is. So Rent21, it the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st century. And it's basically a global multi-stakeholder network and we're always talking about ourselves at the Coalition of the Willing. So uh, we are bringing together 
together um, international organizations, national governments, industry associations, NGOs, science and academia. So when we're talking about national government, there is obs obs uh, obviously also um, the sub-national governments, but also uh, regional governments uh, participate. And uh, this multi-stakeholder approach is really key to our approach. Uh, the collaborative approach is two. Um, so since 2005, we're publishing every year um, the Renewables Global Status Report, uh, which um, is building on this community. So in the last edition, which has been published beginning of June, um, there was an active participation of uh, approximately 400 experts participating as contributors, reviewers, authors, lead authors, etc. Um, basically, the report's objective is really to report on the status of renewable energy worldwide, looking into all renewable energy technologies, all sectors, all policy levels, so uh, globally, regionally, uh, nationally, and also locally. Um, the chapter, the report comprises uh, the global overview, the market and industry trends for the different renewable energy technologies. We have a chapter on distributed renewables for energy access, investment, the policy landscape and since last year also uh, a new chapter on enabling technologies and energy system integration because we really see that I mean that's a big trend and it's also a big need that we need to have a much more integrated approach we're talking about sector coupling here we're talking about the role of uh, storage um, the linking uh, e-mobility and um, and renewable energy, the question of digitalization, etc. We have a changing uh, feature every year. Last year was on deconstructing baseload. Probably for you, uh, for the audience here, more interesting. The year before, we had one on community energy, where we really try to show as much uh, comprehensive and recent data as possible on new sectors. Um, Maybe one of the reasons why I'm mentioning this is really that uh, our objective here is also to make you show that there are platforms where you can engage and uh, in this report uh, you're really invited to engage and show the increasing role of local players in the renewable energy developments. Uh, when we're looking at the year of 2016, uh, the big trend is uh, that investors uh, were acquiring more renewable energy capacity for less money. So that's a very good news. Uh, we have 176 countries uh, which had renewable energy targets, and as has been mentioned at the local level, we we clearly see that targets are, um, as Anna mentioned, are first triggered to then also move to action and implementation. Um, 2016 set again records on installed renewable energy power capacity with 161 gigawatt um, added and this was an increase of 9% relative to 2015 um, with the leading technologies being PV and uh, wind. Um, for the fifth consecutive year investment in new renewable power capacity was double the investment in new fossil fuel generation in generating capacity. It's really um, uh, so we're going in the right direction um, and also for the third year in a row uh, global energy related CO2 emissions uh, was decoupled um, for, and um, despite actually the growth of a global economy and increased demand for energy. This is linked to renewable energy uh, but also obviously to energy efficiency activities. Um, so basically, yes, an extraordinary year for renewable energy with total global capacity being up 9% uh, compared to 2015, uh, more than 2016 gigawatt at year's end of um, capacities, not including large hydropower. Um, so when you're looking, I will not go into the detail of the different technologies uh, and markets, but uh, in the report you will find uh, lots of detailed data here. What we're looking at, and I'm mentioning this, uh, so we're also looking at renewable energy champions. Um, and uh, here we'll see like investment in renewable energy power and fuels. Obviously, we have China, which makes something like two thirds of renewable energy power capacities, for instance, the US, United Kingdom, Japan, and Germany. These are also very often countries which are engaged since a longer time, had policy since a lo longer time to foster renewable energy. Um, but when we are looking into investment um, in renewable power and 
in fuels uh, per unit of GDP, we see very different countries. Uh, it's Bolivia, Senegal, Jordan, Honduras, and Iceland. And this really shows that it's also important to put this in relation. And um, I'm showing you specifically these countries because when we were, for instance, looking at, uh, at Los Angeles, which is, or California, uh, sorry, California, which is, I think, the seventh or ninth uh, uh, economy uh, of the world, um, it really shows that uh, there is also a need from our side and a will from our side not to only report on the big countries but also show the efforts of other places. So an invitation again to help us shaping this. Uh, very quickly, renewable energy in the world, uh, renewables represented 19.3% of global final energy consumption. Um, traditional biomass share is slightly going down, is now reaching 9.1%. Um, in the power sector, um, by year's end, there was an estimated of 30% of the world power generating capacity uh, being renewable and uh, recovering 24.5% uh, of global electricity demand. Um, I will move to heating and cooling, um, where renewables uh, represented approximately 9% of total global heat demand. What we clearly see is, so this was something built on biomass and solar thermal and geothermal. Um, however, this was a sector where developments were more difficult um, because there were comparatively low fossil fuel prices and a lack of policy support. In the transport sector, liquid biofuels represent 4% of world road transport fuels. Biogas in transport grew substantially uh, in the United States, in Europe also. What we clearly see is a big trend is the electrification of the transport sector, uh, which um, creates a potential market, but also uh, an opportunity, potentially an opportunity for including variable renewable energy, so PV and wind into the grid. However, when we're really looking into the NDCs, for instance, only two countries uh, which have uh, electrification targets uh, on uh, in their transport sector also link it to renewables so the synergies exist but uh, more in theory than in practice for the moment um, you could already see from from the presentation of the status in the sector that there has been a very very strong focus on power and um, this is something which uh, you can see here. In blue, you have basically the power policies, uh, heating and cooling policies in orange and transport. There is a big focus here. Um, and this is something we need to address collect collectively if we really want to push for the energy transition. So very quickly, solar PV, um, PV capacity, we reached 303 gigawatts and what is really interesting because sometimes you need to bring it down and also show people what this means is the installation of 30, 31,000 PV panels every hour so you can imagine um, the potential for job creation which is also linked to the sector. What is interesting is every continent has an installed capacity, capacity superior to one gigawatt at least 24 countries had one gigawatt or more capacity Capacities, and at least 115 countries had more than 10 megawatts. So it's also a technology as, which is spreading into all regions of the world, which is mainly due to decreased costs. Um, the wind power reached 55 gigawatt of wind power capacity, um, or have been added in 2016, reaching a global total of 487 gigawatt. What is interesting here again is that at least 24 countries met. 5% or more of their annual electricity uh, demand with wind power, which really also shows that the integration of variable renewable energy is possible. Solar thermal heating had a growth of 5%, and I'm mentioning this because that's also something which is driven very much by cities, uh, housing programs, part of integrated approaches, um, and it's being sold in 127 countries, showing again that we are talking about the global market here. Um, I'm mentioning this for our place from uh, the developing countries. Uh, what we really also 
see it, the off-grid market is taking up uh, a lot in Eastern Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, in Southeast Asia. Sales of off-grid solar system reached 8.1 million units worldwide um, and leading countries are India, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda and Tanzania. Now, renewable energy in cities, I will not go very much into detail here. Um, because we heard a lot about this. Uh, what I think is interesting to mention from our side is why are cities moving more and more in this direction? It's really the local targets and policy. There is an increasing interest and they are becoming very important actors. But what is really just important to put into person or to understand again is the population growth and urbanization is really also uh, a big, big um, yeah, driver, because there is an increasing demand for energy services in cities and in 2014, for instance, energy demand in cities represented 65% of global energy demand. So that's this also explains why cities have an increasing role here. So this obviously, all these uh, trends materialize in global investment uh, in renewable energy. So uh, in 2016, this was of 241.6 billion USD, uh, which represents, however, a decrease of 23% compared to uh, 2015. This is ex explained uh, by different uh, trends. One is the dropping costs. The other one is, however, that China, uh, the, which uh, represents a huge market for renewable energy, has um, a, a decreased actually in installed capacities. Also, because the Chinese government has basically, for the moment, um, reoriented part of their energy infrastructure investment into the transmission and distribution infrastructure to allow for a better intake of renewable energy um, and then obviously also some leading countries have cut off uh, their renewable energy support so that's uh, impacting um, impacting the investment however it's important to keep in mind that it roughly represents still double uh, the investment in new fossil fuel capacity um, I'll pass over that's a comparison of renewables to fossil fuel and nuclear capacity so you can see this in the report also to show you that when we are talking about distributed renewable energy today it's really increasingly accepted and uh, understood that uh, these off-grid markets really represent economic opportunities so for instance pay-as-you-go companies solar PV companies have um, raised 223 million USD in 2016, which was an increase of 40% compared to 2015. As I said, uh, renewables, what are drivers? I mean, clearly it's climate change, it's air pollution, it's industry developments, it's also jobs. So jobs have uh, 9.8 million uh, people were working on renewable energy, which is an increase of 1.1% over 2015 and um, this is definitely a big driver at the local level uh, but also the national level. So very positive developments but things are not going quick enough. This slide is a little complex so I'll invite you or I invite you to have a look at this more in detail but when you're looking at the um, yellow so the orange, uh, the orange bubble is the increase uh, from 2004 to 2014 of renewable energy altogether, traditional biomass and modern renewable. It's plus 2.8 percent. Modern renewables have increased by 4.7 percent. However, when we are comparing it with the purple bubble, which is the energy demands, plus also the gray bubble, which is the fossil fuel and nuclear, we just see that it's not going quick enough because it does not allow us to um, really have, um, yeah, to, to really address or counterbalance the growth in energy demand and the still the increase in fossil fuel and nuclear. So this is really an invitation that we should, we need to continue moving forward and quicker. Otherwise, we will not reach uh, CO2, uh, CO2 goals. Um, 
so the conclusion, global renewable energy transition is advancing with record capacity. So there is a success stories, but there is a need for uh, more. Um, decoupling is taking place. Uh, the program is not fast enough and uh, to increase this we really need a better integrated sectoral planning, smarter and more flexible systems um, and a systems approach. So linking renewable energy to energy efficiency, use of enabling technologies etc and again this is another reason why cities have a key role to play. So that's a conclusion on the report. I would just like to show you um, uh, two slides and I'll be quick uh, on the rent on community because it's over 800 active contributors and reviewers. We're tracking 155 countries covering basically 96% of global GDP and 96% uh, of uh, global population and it's a really a collaborative approach. Our objective is basically also to make this platform available uh, to players like ICLE, people in your audience, the industry associations, um, etc. So the different sectors to really show the advancements of the sectors to show the right and uh, timely or right image of what renewable energy are globally today and also in a timely manner. And uh, since uh, our call is also to invite you, so ICLE is basically contributing on the carbon registry and also with their network to the Global Sets report. But clearly our objective is to strengthen basically um, the stories and the data and uh, basically in the GSR so that we are also able to show and uh, raise the awareness more on the key role of uh, local players. So. We're inviting you to participate. Um, data collection for the GSR 2018 will take place in October 2017. Um, so ICLE will share this data collection with the community basically. In January and March, April, there is a GSR peer review of different chapters. They will be launched uh, in June 2018, most likely back to back with SAM, with the Clean Energy Minister. Material, but that's still something to be defined and uh, then there are continuous outreach event from the launch on so the invitation to you share your data uh, or re basically feed your data into carbon so that it also materializes in the GSR participate in the peer review and if you're interested for us to join an outreach event send you publications organize webinars don't hesitate to contact me thank you very much Great, thank you very much, Rana, for that overview and definitely a document worth reading and looking looking forward to the next publish, publications as well. Um, I'd like to respond to some of our questions that came in. Um, so if you do have questions in the meantime, please feel free to type them into the questions section or raise your hand and we'll monitor um, if you do have a question from your side. At this stage, quickly responding to a question from Molly, uh, she asks about the link between ClearPath, which is a ClearPath basic is a greenhouse gas inventory tool, helping local governments to develop a robust inventory and how this is connected to the Carbon Climate Registry. We have created um, an automated data upload. So if you use ClearPath to create your inventory, you can just push a button, register on the Carbon Climate Registry that you have a profile there, and immediately we can pull in your inventory so that you do not have to type it in again. Uh, that helps our local and other subnational governments to uh, spend less time on uh, double reporting, if you will, and that they can do more comprehensive reporting on other elements. Um, Anna, here's a question maybe you could take for us. Um, could we talk about how the use, the, car the use of the Carbon Climate Registry to compare cities? So that's reference to our benchmarking uh, service. Uh, yes, thank you, Maraka. I'll be glad to. Uh, when benchmarking uh, cities, uh, we always need to be very careful because uh, cities are very different between themselves uh, in the different aspects uh, due to the location and climate, but also due to the structure of their economy. Uh, but yes, definitely, uh, through the data that we collect in Carbon, uh, so I've given, you, I've given you a glimpse that Carbon gathers different types of data. Uh, for example, the energy performance, uh, what does this include? <coughs> Apologies. Uh, this covers, for example, final energy consumption uh, at community scale, 
Uh, it includes primary energy consumption uh, and is aggregated uh, by the different sectors. It also gathers data on energy generation. Uh, disaggregated by fuel, etc. Uh, it also gathers data on uh, local government operations. Of course, it is always voluntary. Uh, the, the city chooses uh, with the level of detail with which they want to report. Of course, the more detailed the reporting is, uh, the better we can tell the story of that city. And uh, both Rana and Lloyd have already mentioned the importance of telling the story. Uh, but so we gather information on energy performance. We also gather information on specific sectors, uh, for example, the building sector, the transport sector, and so on, that then enable us to estimate certain sector-specific benchmarks. Of course, we also get gather data on the GDP, on the population, the area, etc. Uh, but of course, uh, this this uh, word of caution always remain. We always need to be careful in comparing cities to make sure that we are being fair in the comparisons being made. But definitely, the data. Uh, that cities report in carbon do do support us in in learning lessons. Um, I hope I answered the question. Great, thank you very much, Anna. <clears throat> so, for those active users of the Carbon Climate Registry, we'd be happy to also explore your particular benchmarking needs um, and see if we can build that in um, as a service to all of you. Um, I think we're. Well, more questions coming in. There's a question from the Philippines. If we have any materials or PowerPoints to share um, that could be used for community awareness raising um, and focusing particularly on this issue, uh, we'd be happy to share. So please send us an email to the carbon at ecli.org email address and we can um, explore your particular needs to see what we could share. We would also be delighted if you could join the 100% Renewable Energy Cities and Regions Initiative. Um, that network is aimed also at helping cities that are just starting up or regions just starting up in this space, um, but with a clear understanding that we need to make a full transition to 100% renewables as extensively as we can, ideally also using local renewable energy, which most of our regions around the world have plenty um, uh, or great abundance of. Um, are there any questions? I just check if we have any raised hands to see if there are questions coming in verbally as well. I do not see anything at the moment. Okay, there's a question from Matt. Are there benefits to reporting through CDB and CARBON? The benefits, maybe a brief overview, there is CDP cities and then there is the CARBON climate registry. These are two platforms specifically created for local governments to report. Um, the benefits essentially would be at the moment, we're also exploring how these two databases could better work together. We are sharing some core data points for the Compact of Mayors and now the Global Covenant of Mayors, where ICLE, um is one of the first data partners to the UNFCCC's NASCA. So this is the national uh, I well, admitted I can't recall what the abbreviation stands for, but essentially this is the, the platform created by the UN FCCC to share data and particularly to show national governments what is already happening at the city level. CDP is also sharing some of its data through this um, platform and we hope to really show a much bigger percentage um, of really excellent and good practices around the world on the kinds of targets that local governments set and renewable energy targets is now this new space where we we're seeing exciting renewable targets. We hope that very soon they would also share examples of actions and then we would for example include the Vancouver's, the Barcelona's um, and the Malmo's and others. We want to show good practice cases that can help others understand how to push boundaries and make sure that we can also um, share amongst each other. Uh, ICLA is also a network that facilitates peer-to-peer -peer exchange and we'd be happy to make sure um, that we can put you in touch with your peers and ideally join some of our projects which we run with other partners such as ideally REN21 
and others to make sure that we can help you advance at your own tempo, but understanding that we are in a space of urgency where we need to switch faster on renewables and be much more energy efficient. There's another question on the registry and CDP. Yes, you can share your data from CDP to the Carbon Climate Registry, but this would only be the core data set for the Compact of Mayors if you are currently committed to the Compact of Mayors. I would propose that you reach out to ICLE and we can take you through the process um, to understand where you are and we'd be happy to help you on reporting. A very brief overview. We've had three very different presentations on topics that all relate to city data. We know that reporting is going to become more and more important to understand are we on track or are we not yet getting there at a fast enough tempo. For ICLEI, we're also offering our database to connect to national systems, that this could be used as a national reporting system for different countries. And indeed, we try to make it as easy and as user-friendly for local governments to report, for the regional governments to report. We know, as you've heard from Lloyd, one person dealing with climate reporting, we know that the teams are small, but we also know that the data is critically needed to understand where good practice emerges and where things need to be um, supported, where technical assistance could be offered. And as ICLEI, we definitely track all of these reports um, and also work with our members to make sure that we can give them technical assistance. I would highly encourage you, please respond to that survey uh, on community energy. We need to understand your particular viewpoints and this will feed into the IRENA process help us contribute to the REN21 report. This is really a fabulous report and it is very well read and used to inform national governments. If you bring your city, your town, your region to report through our system, we can make sure that you have a robust reporting that can feed into the REN21 report and we'd be happy to push that data up into the UNFCCC NASCA system. It's been interesting to hear that as Rana mentioned, there's been a lot of investment in some countries in distribution infrastructure, so that does take a little bit of money away from the renewable energy investment, but still would actually help the future scaling up of renewables um, into the global grid or into the national grid or into the local decentralized grids, where we would like to see many more decentralized and mini grids evolving and connecting to each other and ideally cover the world in the long run. Last question. Is there any other question? Let me check if anybody has raised their hands in the meantime. Nope, I see no raised hands. This is a very quiet audience. <laughs> Marika? I don't know if you yes. hear me. This is Rana speaking. Yes. Um, yes, it's, it's Rana from Rent in One. Uh, just uh, taking the uh, the advantage of this uh, silent audience uh, to also um, basically uh, sh show that there are also the developments in the renewable energy sector also raise questions on how to reflect, for instance, um, this changing ways of supporting renewable energy. So there is a, a trend on having auction systems which have an impact on community energy. So that's really super important uh, uh, that uh, we have some feedback of the cities and that uh, I would support this invitation to, uh, to participate in the survey. But the feedback of cities to see to what extent the national, um, the national uh, support policies have an impact, ease or make the development of uh, community energy easier or more difficult because this is also being used uh, for lobbying again and for creating the best uh, policy framework. That's one part. The other part I want to raise is um, when we're talking, for instance, on the trend we see in China that they're investing now in transmission distribution, even though, I, I mean, basically, uh, on the paper, it looks like they are closing or bringing down the support for renewable energy, which is not really the case because they really have a vision where they're going and these infrastructure developments are also needed. So um, this also sh shows to, that we need um, indicators which are also adapting to um, reflect these trends. And that's really 
an invitation to also participate in this process because it's difficult at the global level to always see what trends are taking place here and we really rely on the community and uh, to have this feedback so that we can also adapt our reporting systems. Great, thanks for clarifying, Rana. Much appreciated. And indeed, um, as we see more reporting and more indicators evolve, that we could track things at a strategic level, but also at the local level, it would definitely help our um, making sure that we're on track, backing, looping it back to the Paris Agreement. We have a global agreement that we need to really support and make sure we can achieve the targets. And in essence, what we need to understand is how these local and other sub-regional targets connect to the nationally determined contributions, the NDCs. Uh, this is a discussion that will take place at the COP23, where we will have very intensive debates on some of these issues to see how we can shape the framework to move forward and to track and monitor uh, the developments in this space. I would like to thank everyone and in particular our, our three speakers very much for their contributions and input and we look forward to your questions so please continue sharing those. Um, you can, you're welcome to share questions to the carbon at icle.org email address and we will also respond to those individual questions that you have asked uh, to see how we can assist you with your pres presentations to your community and about the registration and reporting on the Carbon Climate Registry. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us and I wish you a wonderful good morning, good afternoon or good evening wherever you are. Thank you and goodbye.